ETH Zurich. Uh, who will talk about point counting over finite fields with applications in algebraic geometry? Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoni, for the invitation. It's my pleasure to give this lecture series at uh, Chicago. Now let's um, let's get started. Let's get started. Mm. Now I will set up the notation for the first lecture. FQ is a finite field with Q elements. And we consider a polynomial f with coefficients in fq, fq of x1 up to xn, polynomial of degree n, of degree d, degree d, and n will be greater than or equal to 2, n is fixed at the very beginning. Sometimes we'll be using geometric language instead of a polynomial, we'll be talking about a hypersurface in the affine n space over fq hypersurface of degree d. The lecture today is explicit enough so that uh, I'll be using more often the language of uh, polynomials. We're interested in the following number, the number of a1 until a n in fq to the n, such that f of a1 up to a n is equal to zero. The number of solutions of the equation f equals zero. You may prefer to call this the number of the number of v of f. Oops. Mm. You may prefer to call this the number of v of f fq points on the hypersurface v of f. Now for us. For us, Q will be large relative to D. We'll be thinking of D, the degree of the polynomial, as fixed. And then Q, the size of the finite field, will be large. This will be a common feature in all four lectures. I'll make comments about it as we go. And the goal today, the goal is to estimate this quantity capital N. This is a problem that has been uh, well researched. It's of interest to number theorists, algebraic geometers, arithmetic geometers. Mm, it's, a, it's a problem that we'll look at today. Now, let's do a few examples. For example, very basic polynomial, the most basic example is if I take a polynomial xn minus another polynomial in x1 until xn minus one. Then once you specify x1 through xn minus one, xn is uniquely determined and capital N is very easy, q to the n minus one. Another example that you're familiar with, f is an equation defining an elliptic curve, y squared minus, let's say, x cubed minus x, and let's say two doesn't divide q. Odd characteristic, this defines an elliptic curve. And then, you know the Hasse bound n is approximately q with error up to two square root of q. You know, for um, if you specify the value of x, the question is whether x cubed minus x is a perfect square. If it is, there will be two values of y. If not, there will be no values of y. And half of the time it will be a square, roughly, roughly. And that's why you have roughly q with an error term. Or we can draw it like this. Q. And then in green, in green, I will draw this interval of radius two square root of Q. And N is here. N belongs to an interval like that. These are two basic examples of polynomials. We are interested in counting the number of solutions. Now, a fundamentally important definition for our talks definition, a polynomial f with coefficients in fq as above is absolutely or geometrically irreducible if 
it is irreducible. Not only is a polynomial with coefficients in FQ, but if you regard it in FQ bar of X1 until Xn. Now, the examples we had above are geometrically reducible because even if you look at them in FQ bar, they stay irreducible. Now, it's very important to keep in mind a non-example. Non-example, f equals, how about f equals x square minus a y square with coefficients in fq, where a is not a square in fq. Since a is not a square in fq, this polynomial is irreducible over fq. A is not a square. But over the algebraic closure, A becomes a square, and then the polynomial will factor as two linear polynomials over the algebraic closure. So this is the non-example we want to keep in mind. Now, here, what is the number of FQ solutions if X and Y belong to FQ and satisfy the equation F equals zero? Well, why shouldn't be non-zero? Otherwise, A would be a perfect square, but it's not. So N is one. It's only zero, zero is the only solution. So N is one. In this case, N is very small, very small. Now, fact, fact, suppose let F in FQ of XY be irreducible but not geometrically reducible. I'll be abbreviating like this as we go. Irreducible, but not geometrically irreducible. Then, n, by the way, I will scroll up again. Here is our n, the number of solutions of the equation f equals zero. It would be nice if we remember this definition of capital N. That's what it will denote for the entire talk. I cannot um, copy it. It's only on that screen in the tablet. So the number of solutions of f equals 0 is very, very small. It's less than or equal to d squared over 4. Remember, d is the degree of the polynomial. It's bounded by the degree. doesn't matter how large the field is. Even if the field is very large, you're not going to get many FQ rational points on the hypersurf on the curve defined by f. Let's give a quick proof. It's familiar to the arithmetic geometers. Now, it's not geometrically reducible, so I can factor f of xy as f1 of xy all the way until fs of xy in the algebraic in fq bar of xy. And by assumption, S is greater than or equal to 2. This is our assumption, that it's not geometrically reducible. Now, then, if I look at a solution of f equals 0 with coordinates in fq, so if I look at an fq solution of f equals 0, a priori, it's a solution of one of these. It's a 0 of one of these polynomials f1 up to fs. However, we have the Frobenius. The, the, the Frobenius raises to the qth power. The Frobenius fixes that solution because it has coordinates in fq, and the Frobenius acts on these irreducible factors. But it has to act transitively on the irreducible factors. Because an orbit of Frobenius, if you look at an orbit of Frobenius, it's fixed by Frobenius, so that orbit will, the product of the polynomials in the orbit will have coefficients in fq, and this will, um, this will be an fq factor of f, but we assume that f is fq irreducible. So the Frobenius acts transitively on these factors, and therefore any fq solution is a solution of each one of them, in particular of f1 and of f2. Here we are using that you have at least two of them. Any FQ solution is a solution of each of them. Now, here, this set has size at most. Here we are using Bezout's theorem. Size at most degree of F1 times degree of F2 
which is less than or equal to call this degree d1, d2, d1 plus d2 square over four, less than or equal to d square over four. d is the degree of the polynomial f, it's the sum of the degrees. So it's at least d1 plus d2. And here is the inequality. The number of fq solutions of f is at most d square over four as we claim. Notice if for example, d is equal to two, then n is at most one. That's why here we had at most, we had one solution. Now, geometrically, what is happening here geometrically? Geometrically, our hypersurface looks like two lines. I draw them dotted because you don't really see them. You only see them over the algebraic closure. And what we proved below is that any FQ point on the hypersurface on the curve belongs to each of these two lines. But two lines can only intersect at one point. That's why, that's why in the end we have only one solution. And that's why we have so few solutions when the polynomial is irreducible, but geometrically reducible. Okay, now this is what happens in this case. But the real question is, what happens when the polynomial is geometrically irreducible? And this is the first important result that we state, theorem has veil. Well, 1948. Let f in fq of xy be geometrically irreducible of degree d. Then the number of fq rational points on the curve it defines is approximately q with error up to d minus 1, d minus 2 square root of q plus d plus 1. This is a fundamentally important result. You're familiar, for example, when d is equal to 3, and you have, let's say, and, and let's say f defines an elliptic curve, then you get 2 square root of q. You don't even have the last term. You need the last term because f may not define a non-singular curve. So to put it differently, here is the number of solutions. It's roughly q with a certain interval. Capital N belongs to a certain interval centered at q. In green, I'll be indicating an interval where capital N belongs. OK, now this is Hasseveil. At the end of the talk, you will ask, hey, where is the algebraic geometry today? What we'll do later in this lecture doesn't look like we'll be doing too much algebraic geometry, but the algebraic geometry is embedded in this theorem. We'll be using today this theorem. OK, now this is if I have a plane curve. Let's look at the hypersurface. Let's look at the higher dimensional case. Theorem, theorem of Langveil. Langveil. 1954. This theorem will be fundamentally important in our lectures. Let f in fq, I'll state it now for hypersurfaces because today we deal with hypersurfaces and uh, then I'll state it in the general form later as we get to it. In fq of x1 up to xn, be geometrically reducible of degree d. Then, again, the number of solutions in fq of f equals 0, it's approximately q to the n minus 1 with an error. Again, you have d minus 1, d minus 2. Here again, you have q to the n minus 1 and then minus another half. So n minus 3 halves plus a constant that depends only on d and n, but I will not use n in the notation because we think of n as uh, fixed at the very beginning. So n is really rigid for us. I suppress it from the notation. A constant times q to the n minus 2. Again, the number of solutions is approximately q to the n minus 1. Remember this example, the first example with the graph when the polynomial is 
the last variable minus a polynomial in the previous variables. Then it's exactly q to the n minus one, and it belongs to a certain interval. Let's call it the lang veil interval. So n is here. And the question that we are interested in, the question, or rather the goal, is make cd, make the constant cd explicit. Give explicit values for the constant, that is to say, give explicit Langveil bounds. Okay, so there is a lot of literature on this. I will summarize only what is um, relevant. By the way, this bound here of Langveil, it can be improved if you know, for example, that F defines a non-singular hypersurface then this exponent n minus three halves, I can replace by n divided by two. This is a result of the mean. The, the error is big O of Q to the n over two, but we're not going into this. Just to tell you here, that if you have any chance to achieve, to make this bound um, tight, you have to look at uh, very singular hypersurfaces. Okay, theorem. 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 Gorpa de La Chaux, 2002. One can take CD 12 D plus 3 to the N plus first power. CD is polynomial in D like this. Now, the bounds before Gorpa de la Chaux, they were very bad. They were like exponential in D. So they prove this. Now, the goal, their goal is not to prove a bound, to give a bound on CD. They prove a lot more in their article. They use advanced eladic cohomology techniques and they uh, express, they give bounds on Betty numbers and then use then prove generalizations of uh, Lipschitz uh, trace formulas, theorems that were uh, proven for non-singular complete intersections. They generalize them for possibly singular complete intersections. They do a lot of work. They prove a lot. And an outcome of their work is that one can take CD to be 12 times D plus three to the N plus first power. Okay, the next, the next bound, the next bound is uh, Kafura Matera, 2006. One can take CD to be 5D to the 13 over 3. That's a big improvement when N is large. D to the a little more than fourth power. If Q is bigger than 15 D to the 13 over three. And remember that for us, we're really interested in the case when Q is large. This is the regime that we're focusing on. If Q is very large, one can take CD to be quadratic, five D square plus D plus one. So for large Q, CD, one can take CD to be quadratic. I will say a word about their idea because what we'll do is um, inspired by their proof. Now their idea is to intersect the hypersurface defined by F with planes H. I want to emphasize that we're really talking about planes, like two dimensional planes in an over fq. And when you intersect the hypersurface with the plane, you get a plane curve. Generally, you get a plane curve and then use the hasset veil bound for the plane curve that you get. This is their idea. And they choose their planes very carefully. They work on how to choose their planes. For example, is there a plane so that the intersection is geometrically irreducible? There may not be if Q is small. If Q is large, there will be such a plane. And then 
look at the number of planes so that the intersection has two geometrically reducible FQ components and so on. They choose their planes very carefully. Now, what we'll do is inspired by this idea to intersect with planes. Now, just to tell you where we are going, this is a course on point counting over finite fields. Today, I'll illustrate a certain point counting technique, but uh, let me also tell you the final result that we'll be able to obtain. So here is what we'll get to. We'll, I'll state it now imprecisely and then we'll get the precise statement together with the proof. We'll exhibit an explicit interval, an interval where capital N does not belong. We will exhibit a forbidden zone. So it will be like this. Remember capital N is supposed to be near Q to the N minus one. And we'll give an interval like this. So that capital N for sure is not here. I will be discussing the interval on the left of Q to the N minus one, just for expository purposes to make things notationally simpler. There is a similar interval also on the right. Okay, now our interval, interestingly, actually overlaps. If we, we are going to prove this only using the hasse veil bound. And then we look at what is known in the literature. We look at the lang veil intervals in the literature, and we see that for a certain range of Q, our interval is conti contained in the known lang veil intervals. Or actually, for large Q, for large Q, our interval, so this is the picture for Q large. When Q is large, our interval contains the left endpoint of the best known lang veil interval. And because we have this forbidden interval, we have an improvement on the Langveil interval. And uh, similarly, we have the improvement on the right. And uh, let me state it like this. In particular, I haven't given the specifics, but once I give you the specifics, it will be clear. In particular, if Q is large, I can tell you how large, 5D to the 13 over 3, one can take CD to be D plus 10 linear. Oops. Mm. Linear. So we bring it down to linear. If we go back, I will scroll up now. Here, the best known bound is bound is this quadratic in D. But if we keep scrolling up, if we go back to the case of curves, this here is linear. This is the CD in the case of curves. There is a Q to the zeroth power implicit that we don't write. The CD in the case of curves is linear. And uh, it's going to be linear also for hypersurfaces. So we prove that, yes, we bring it down to linear. We can take this to be linear. OK, perfect. Now, I, I want to say that um, these bounds are the best known bounds in the literature in the regime when Q is large relative to D. This is what we're looking at. You can look at other ranges of Q. You can uh, maybe fix your finite field FQ at the beginning and then consider D to be large. A large degree hypersurface in a fixed small finite field. I don't do that. I don't do small Q. I only do large Q. Now, I'm sure there are number theorists here in the audience who are smiling now. I leave uh, for the number theorists the cases of uh, small Q and uh, large D. But uh, in our lectures, Q is going to be large. OK. So here is the idea. Idea. 
let's look at the solution set. Let E be the set of A1 up to AN in FQ to the N, such that F of A1 up to AN is equal to zero. This is a subset of FQ to the N. Intersect E with now, Kafura and Matera intersected with carefully chosen planes. They work to find suitable planes with which they intersect, and then on the slices, they apply the Hassel Bale value. But we're going to intersect it with a random plane. H, I emphasize two dimensional, an actual plane. Uh, by pl when I say plane, it's not necessarily passing through the origin in fq to the n. Now, this this idea you can find on Terry Tao's block. So I state here lemma one, lemma one, random sampling. And you can find it on Terry Tao's block. The proof we'll give is a combi we combine the Kafura Matera idea to look at slices with the plane with Terry Tao's idea to, to um, study the statistics when you intersect this set with the random plane. Now here is this lemma. It's purely combinatorial. There is no algebraic geometry in the lemma. It's, it's really point counting. It's um, combinatorics. So let E be a subset of FQ to the N. Subset, just a subset. And let N be the cardinality of E. You can imagine <laughs> the notation is suggestive enough for us. We'll apply this with E being the solution set of a polynomial equation and N the number of solutions. For a plane, H, in fq to the n, chosen uniformly at random, consider the intersection of e and h as a random variable. Or to put it differently, intersect E with every single plane and uh, keep track of the data that you get. What kinds of numbers do you get? Then, well, it's easy to compute the mean. This is the mean. It's very easy to compute the mean. In order to compute the mean, I have to calculate how many planes pass through a given point. So the mean is the cardinality of the set divided by Q to the N minus two because one over Q to the N minus two, that fraction of all the planes pass through a given point. This is very easy to calculate. And then the variance, the variance is also easy to calculate because to calculate the variance really boils down to calculating the second moment. And to calculate that, you need to calculate how many planes pass through two distinct points of E. And here is the thing, the number of planes that pass through two distinct points of E is independent of which two points of E we take. And therefore the mean and the variance, they don't depend on the set E very much, they only depend on its size. That's why this is a very easy lemma to prove. I will actually spell out the details of this lemma, but next time, because Next time we'll use it again and um, a certain computation will be connected with what we'll be doing next time. The variance satisfies an inequality. It's less than or equal to n over q to the n minus two. You can calculate the variance exactly and you can give this bound. The variance is small. This is the thing, the variance is small. So if I have a subset in fq to the n and start intersecting it with hyperplanes, most intersections will be very close to the mean. Now, okay, so now we're going to combine 
by the way, in in the block of Terry Tau, this is given, this lemma is done for hyperplanes. And next time we'll do it for hyperplanes. But it immediately adapts to planes. Next, next time we'll prove, we'll use that idea. We'll see that this idea can be used to refine the classical Bertini irreducibility theorem. Okay, so look what happens here. This is our set. Now, we have to bring in the algebraic geometry. We are going to apply this to the solution set of a polynomial equation over FQ. And this is combinatorial. Now, our E, which is the set of FQ points on the hypersurface like this, in FQ to the N, is the solution set of a polynomial equation. Now, if I stop here, if I finish the sentence here, you will have an objection. You will have a very a, a valid objection. You will say, hold on, any subset of FQ to the N is the solution set of a polynomial equation by means of interpolation. You can give me a subset, I can concoct the polynomial which vanishes exactly on this set and which is Mm, which assumes some other value elsewhere. I can make it to be to equal one elsewhere. So how is it useful that is the set of solutions of a polynomial equation? Well, of a polynomial equation of degree D. Not every set is the set of solutions of a polynomial equation of degree D. So that's what we have to use about our set. Now, lemma two, let's go to lemma two. Lemma two. Lemma two out of two, there will be only lemmas one and two. That's where we, we have the algebraic geometry. Let's call this lemma dichotomy. Dichotomy lemma. Let f in fq of x1 until xn be geometrically reducible of degree d. Let e be the solution set a1 up to an in fq to the n so that f of a1 until a n is zero inside f q to the n. Let h be a plane, h2 inside f q to the n, be a plane, any plane. By this I mean, again, a translation of a plane in the sense of linear algebra. So h doesn't have to pass through the origin. Then either I have to look at the intersection of our set E with H. Either the intersection of E and H is very large or the intersection of E and H is very small. This is the dichotomy. They're either very large or very small. Now, let's start the proof. Let's start the proof and then we'll complete the bounds as we go. I have finished stating the lemma qualitatively. <laughs> That's what it says qualitatively. Now, the exact quantities will work out when we start the proof. The proof, mm, it's a little weird, but let me use the language of polynomials because the talk is explicit enough. I can use the language of polynomials. Now, I have to look at the intersection of this solution set E together with the plane H. So I can restrict F to H. Now, if you're thinking geometrically, I'm taking the intersection of the hypersurface defined by F with H. Now, or if you want, you can think of F restricted to H. You parameterize H in terms of two variables, U and V. 
and then f is a polynomial in n variables. So you just plug in this parametrization, you get the polynomial in two variables u and v, well defined up to reparametrizing the plane. So I can think of like this, a polynomial in two variables and factor this, factor this as f1 of uv until fs of uv in f cube of uv. Factor it over f cube. Or geometrically, the hypersurface intersected with h. You look at it over f cube and split it into f cube reducible components. The question is at least one fi of uv geometrically reducible. Do you have at least one geometrically reducible factor among its fq irreducible factors? If yes, well, if one of them is geometrically reducible, it has a lot of fq points. Then let's say if yes, let's say fi equals zero intersection with fq square. So the number of fq points, the number of these points greater than or equal to q minus and then the degree minus one, the degree minus two square root of q minus di minus one by Haseveo. By Haseveo applied for fi of uv. It's a polynomial in two variables. It defines a plane curve, geometrically reducible. It has that many fq points. Now, note that d, the degree of f, is greater than or equal to di. So this quantity, I can continue the chain of inequalities, is greater than or equal to the same thing if instead of di, I put d, because any di is with a minus. Now I can go back here, I can go back and complete the inequality in case one, the size of the intersection is at least q minus d minus one, d minus two, square root of q minus d minus one. By using Haseveo on this slice, on this plain slice. What happens if no? If no, then if all of the factors are fq irreducible, but geometrically they become reducible. Remember our example from the beginning with x squared minus a times y squared. Such polynomials have very few fq points. So in this case, n less than or equal to summation one quarter times degree fi square i from one to s. This is what we proved at the very beginning about the curve, which is FQ reducible, but geometrically reducible. And this is less than or equal to D square over four, because D is the sum of all the degrees. And now I can complete here the bounds, less than or equal to D square over four. There we go. So the intersection is either very large or very small. Let's say that um, intersections that are very large such H's, let's say that H is good. And when the intersection is very small, let's say here that H is bad. In green, we'll have the good H's. In blue, we'll have the bad H's. Okay. So now, now we are ready actually to give the proof. Let me just scroll up to remind you what we are proving. We're going to prove that there is an interval we're going to exhibit an interval where capital N does not belong. And then fortunately, luckily, this interval will overlap with the Lang veil intervals when we look at what's available in the literature. OK, and these are our two lemmas. If we have a subset, we can slice it with planes. And then most values are concentrated close to the mean. And second lemma is that each intersection is either very large or very small. Now let's see what we can pull out of lemma one and lemma two. Now, now we are getting into the actual argument. Okay, so again, take 
Oops, there we go. Take E as usual to be A1 until AN in FQ to the N. So that F of A until AN is equal to zero inside FQ to the N. The solution set of our polynomial equation of degree D and let N be the the order of E. Let's draw, let's draw on a picture what we know. I actually want to see this stuff. So here I'm going to draw a picture. Let's see. I will intersect this set E with a random plane. And then the mean, here is the mean, it's n divided by q to the n minus 2 by our elementary computation about the mean. Now, this is the mean. And here is this quantity d square over 4. This was the left end point of this interval from the dichotomy lemma. OK, so now. The argument works well when we assume that there is a gap here. So let's assume there is a gap. Oops. Let's assume there is a gap. Now, how do I assume there is a gap? You see, capital N is expected to be roughly Q to the N minus 1. And I divide by Q to the N minus 2. So it should be roughly Q. And Q is large for us. D is fixed and small. D is the degree. Yes, there will be a gap. Now, to make it formal, assume, actually, let me write this in color, in red, because I'll refer to that. Assume N is greater than 3 quarters d square q to the n minus 2. Now, you don't have to do three quarters. We are free to adjust the constants. We can adjust the constants as we wish. But um, for expository purposes, let's just make this assumption. It's a very weak assumption, yes? Because n is supposed to be around q to the n minus 1. So n will be roughly q times the right-hand side. Of course, I can assume that n is greater than that. So let's make this assumption so that when we make this assumption, notice n divided by q to the n minus 2, the mean will be, there will be a gap between the mean and this d square over 4. So we achieve this gap. And what we know is that sigma square is small. The variance is small. What does that mean? Small variance means that we have here, if I draw, oops, let me do it. If I imagine an interval centered at the mean and extending left to d square over four, when the variance is small, it means I have many, many values in this interval. So many values intersect H here and very few few h's that are bad, very few bad h's where the value falls to the left of d square over 4. That's the meaning of small variance. Now, what, what, however, however, what we know from our dichotomy lemma is that no value falls in a certain interval here. Remember, each intersection of E and H is either very small or very large. So there is nothing here. And uh, the right hand point of this interval was Q. Oops. The right hand point here is Q minus, just one more, D minus one, D minus two square root of Q minus D minus one. There is nothing in here. And therefore, and therefore, these, there are no values that fall inside this interval. So the conclusion is 
there are many, many, many values that fall in an interval like that. Many values. Many values intersect H fall inside here. This is our conclusion. And what, what can we say? Let me switch to black again. Therefore, therefore, now we can look back at the, look, we can look at the mean again. We can look at the mean and we can refine the bounds on the mean. We made an assumption at the beginning, remember here in red on the top right, that N capital N is great, it's large. So this is an assumption that the mean is large or capital N is large. Now we can look back at the mean. The mean on the one hand, we know it's N divided by Q to the N minus two. On the other hand, it's the probability, it's greater than or equal to probability that H is good times the contribution of each good plane. So before I write the contribution, notice the probability that H is good, good H is, well, when the variance is small, this means that <laughs> very few H's are bad and most H's will be good. So this, the probability that H is good is very large. This is very large. I will make it quantitative if you want, but uh, it's very large. And for each good H, the value of our random variable is at least Q minus D minus one, D minus two square root of Q minus D minus one. Notice, mm, I should say a word about, let me, let me just do one little thing. Let's call this gap here, the gap between D square over four and the mean, let's call it K times Sigma. This is our definition of K. Definition of K and then the probability that H is bad, I'll write this in blue, probability that H is bad. Anytime H is bad, the value of the random variable, so it's, it falls here, yes, to the left of D square over four. So it's at least K sigmas away from the mean. Now we assume the gap is large. That's what we assume at the beginning on the top right in red, when we assume that N is large, the gap is large. Sigma square is small and therefore K has to be large. The probability that H is bad, less than or equal to one over K square. This is Chebyshev's inequality. The probability that a value is at least K sigmas away from the mean, less than or equal to one over K square. And now the gap is large, Sigma is small. Therefore K is large, one over K square is very small. And therefore the probability that H is good here is very large. Notice, notice how sneaky we are. Here on the right hand side, the, the inequality on the bottom of the screen, mu greater than or equal to, for the probability that H is good, we are using the left end point. We're using this left end point of our interval from the dichotomy lemma. We're using that good H's are Mm, yes, we're using that there are very few bad H's and many good H's and we're using the, the, the gap K times Sigma coming from this square over four. And for the contribution of each good H, we are using the right endpoint of our interval from the dichotomy lemma. Okay, so when you look at this, when you look at this inequality in the center of the screen, on the left, I have a capital N. On the right, when you work out this probability, I'm going to skip it just a couple of lines of really elementary computations. So I skip these lines. Very, very elementary. You just use this Chebyshev's inequality and you write it all down. And we get an inequality for capital N. We refine the inequality for capital N. Namely, we get N greater than or equal to Q to the N minus one minus D minus one, D minus two q to the n minus three halves minus d plus 10 q 
to the n minus 2. That's how we get the d plus 10. So what is the upshot? The upshot of this is, remember, we assumed capital uh, N. Yeah. Yes? Can you tell us how to, I mean, at least one line of the estimate probability at age group? I mean, you said it's a couple of lines, but yes, 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 yes. If you can give okay. us just the start so that it does not look like uh, magic. Yes, 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 sure, 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 sure. So let me, uh, let me delete this. Let me delete this. So here, so here define K. So let me write like this. If H is bad, the size of E intersect H minus the mean greater than or equal to yes the distance between the value of the random variable and the mean is greater than or equal to n over q to the n minus 2 minus d square over 4 and this is greater than or equal to now this is let's just see n over, I want to put them on the same screen, is greater than or equal to, let's see, um, can I put here, it will be a certain fraction times n to the q to the n minus 2, n to the 3 quarters, 1 quarter maybe, 3 quarters, um, let's see, what fraction can I put there? One minus, you see, I am assuming that n is greater than three quarters d square q to the n minus two. And now I want n over q to the n minus two minus d square over four three to be quarters. bigger than three quarters, yes? Yes. So I put here three quarters mm, or two thirds or something, yes? Two thirds, one third. Maybe two thirds. Why don't I put two thirds? Two thirds. So I get one third of this greater than this. The three goes upstairs. Yes, this is exactly equivalent to the the assumption that we make. Yes. So now define k so that this is k times sigma. This is our definition of k. And then the probability that H is bad, less than or equal to one over K square. And um, this is Chebyshev. This is Chebyshev's inequality, yes. And two thirds N over Q to the N minus two is equal to K sigma. So one over K square is equal to sigma square Yes, mm -hmm. mm, divided by, <laughs> let's see if we can do the math correctly, 1 over k square is sigma square. Mm, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> okay, yes, that's true, yes, the definition of k. Well, it's converged, these all seem fine, but the limit is... Wait a minute, I didn't hear well, can you say again? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear, I didn't hear. Go on. Uh, okay, so here I have q to the n minus 2 divided by n, yes? Mm -hmm. And then 3 halves. But I have a bound on sigma square. So this is less than or equal to 3 halves times sigma square. What was the bound? It was less than n over... Oh, but here I have to take square, yes. One over k square, is sigma square times this square, yes. <laughs> squared, so here I take the squared. Sigma square is less than n over q to the n minus two, yes. Mm -hmm. This was our bound. And then times q to the n minus two over n, the whole thing square. 
So this okay. thing is equal to nine quarters times Q to the N minus two over N. This is your bound for H bet. Therefore, probability that H good. is good yeah. is greater than or equal to one minus nine quarters. Uh, now that we've done it, let's just do it. Q to the N minus two divided by N. So it's four N minus nine Q to the N minus two divided by four N. And therefore, the mean, which was n over q to the n minus 2, greater than or equal to this probability, 4n minus 9 q to the n minus 2 over 4n, times q minus d minus 1, d minus 2 square root of q minus d minus 1. Now, bring this here, and the q to the n minus 2, bring it there. Therefore, 4n square divided by 4n minus 9q to the n minus 2 greater than or equal to q to the n minus 1 minus this looks like what we want to do q to the n minus 3 halves minus d plus 1 q to the n minus 2 yes it's clear. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. But let me finish. Let me finish. We have. Uh, we 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 are almost done. Yes, we can. We can finish here. Now, I would like to put here an n. But I cannot put an n. Yes, because the inequality is not correct. What I can put is n plus nine q to the n minus two, and now this is correct. Without the nine, it's not correct. But with the nine, it's correct. And then bring it to the right. And that's our refined bound on n. Yes, does it make sense? <laughs> it's good. It's good within the computation. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the question. It's really a couple of lines. Yes, I'm glad you wanted to see it. So here is the upshot. If I make this assumption on n here in red, I make this assumption on n. It's that it's like q to the n minus two, then n, you can see here, you can see here, then it's really large. If it's reasonably large from the beginning, then it has to jump across the whole interval. So here is our upshot. If n is at least three quarters d squared q to the n minus two, again, you can play with the parameters. The moment n goes to the right of this, there is a forbidden zone. It has to keep going until q to the n minus 1 minus d minus 1, d minus 2, q to the n minus 3 halves minus d plus 10, q to the n minus 2. It has to jump all over because, because of our dichotomy here because of the forbidden interval for each slice and because most slices have intersection very close to the mean. And this is our forbidden interval. And again, then you look at how it overlaps with Lang Veil and so on and so on. So that's it. That's it. That's how we refine the Lang Veil bound. And this is our technique of random sampling random hyperplane slicing. We slice with random planes. This is, this is a, you, let's say that this is a Bertini type of argument. Yes, you slice with, in this case, with planes. Next time it will be with hyperplanes. This is a Bertini type of argument, but no, not the most typical Bertini argument. Usually you choose your plane with which you intersect. And here you intersect with every single plane. Again, next time I will also spell out the details in the proof of this random sampling lemma. So yes, that's that's it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Any questions? Kaluyan, can you give us briefly an overview of uh, what will be uh, of the course? Of the course, yeah. Of yes, the yes, 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 yes. So next time in the next lecture, we'll look at this again, random sampling. Mm -hmm. 
will slice with hyperplanes, and then we'll prove a refinement of the classical Bertini theorem. We will reduce to a problem over finite fields, point counting problem over finite fields, and this problem over finite fields will approach through this random sampling. Mm. And then next, the, the lecture after that, we'll look at, so this is, this will be a moduli space problem inside the moduli space of hyperplanes. We'll be looking at special hyperplanes and study the moduli space of those through point counting over finite fields. The next lecture will be inside the moduli space of hypersurfaces of fixed degree. We'll be looking at those whose singular locus has dimension at least one and look at the dimension of that. We will again reduce to point counting. It will be a different point counting. We are not going to use that. We'll be using another idea for point counting. So the next two lectures will be algebraic geometry. There will be scheme theory there. We'll be using uh, schemes over spec Z. Today, today, the thing is I chose to use the language of polynomials because in essence, this is so elementary that uh, why not use the most explicit language? The next two lectures will be using the language of algebraic geometry. And then the last lecture I don't know, the next two lectures, if I can fit them in the two lectures, then there will be the fourth lecture. Otherwise, the content of the next two, I'll spread for the next three. We'll see how it goes. OK, there is one uh, question in the chat. If, uh, if I keep with the schedule I proposed in the abstract, then in the final lecture, we'll look at the problem about point counting and approach it from a geometric perspective. Okay. In the second and third, we look at geometric problems that we reduce to point counting. In the final lecture, if we have the time for that, we'll look at an arithmetic problem about point counting through a geometric um, perspective. Now, let's see the question. Do we have estimation for the irreducible but not geometrically reducible polynomial f of n variables? Irreducible? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Very good. Very good question. Very good question. That's a really good question. Yes, the answer is yes. So, fact, you can prove. Now, if you look at the Langveil theorem for, if you look at Langveil, um, if you look at the Langveil theorem, it will tell you, it will tell you the following. If X, let me use geometric language. If X is in AN over FQ is irreducible over FQ, but not geometrically irreducible, then the number of FQ points on X is big O of Q, um, let's say R dimensional is big O of Q to the R minus R minus one half. This is, if you look at the Langveil theorem, we'll state it in full generality next time. However, if you modify the proof we gave at the very beginning, we gave early today, you can prove that the number of FQ points on X is less than or equal to D square over four times Q to the dimension minus one. You do better. You do better than what you get um, if you just blindly apply Langveil. And um, if it's irreducible but not geometrically irreducible, it has very few FQ points. We did this with R equals 1. We did it with R equals 1. But you can do it uh, for any R. And then you get this really good bound. It's better than the bound you would get if you're just lazy and look up the Langveil theorem and let's apply the Langveil theorem. And you get big O 
of q to the r minus one half. But no, you can you can do even better. You can do q to the r minus one. You just modify the proof we had in the in the beginning. You look at x. It's not geometrically reducible. You split it into fq bar components and then any fq point and so on. So you just modify the proof. So yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah. Have, have people studied how the error in the Lang Bay theorem varies for like distributes for different queues? Uh, wait, wait, wait. I didn't. I didn't hear it well. Can you say it again, please? Have people studied the distribution of the error in Lang Bay for for varying Q? Aha, uh -huh, varying Q. So you increase Q. You increase Q, you keep increasing Q, and uh, what is the distribution of the error? Oh, I, I've seen I've seen uh, results about this, but um, I cannot um, I cannot quote them. There is so much. There is so much. Yes, yes, there is. There is distribution yeah, about the error already. For if you start with an elliptic curve, there is uh, already so much written about this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Man. Yes. 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 Can you say something about the number of points of a scheme in terms of the dimension of its singular locus? Mm, oh yes, in ter something about the number of points, the number of FQ points, let's say on a hypersurface in terms of the dimension of the singular locus, yes. So let X inside AN over FQ. Mm, let me state it over Pn, just to be sure, be a hypersurface and let S be the dimension of X singular. Let pi n be the number of FQ points on Pn. So it's, it's like, um, on p n minus one. Let's go with pi n minus one. So this is like our q to the n minus one before. And then if we look at the number of fq points on x minus pi n minus one. Yes, you expect the number of fq points to be roughly pi n minus one. This is big O of Q to the, now just to make sure, um, R plus um, N plus S divided by two. Do I get it right? So if S is like N minus one, I might be off by, uh, let me see, let me just make sure. Mm, hypersurface R, R plus S, R plus S. Mm, big O. S is, so maybe there is a plus one here. Uh, I, <laughs> I I have to like I I might be missing um, I'm missing something in the exponent but yes the more singular the less singular x is x is the better the bound if x is non singular then the number of fq points on x minus the approximation is big O of Q to the mm, Q to the dimension of X, which is N minus one divided by two. You can, this is due to the lean. And you can state a version where you introduce a variable S, which is the dimension of the singular locus. So, uh, if you want to have big error, if you really want to have a big error, it has to be very singular. I made this comment at the very beginning. Yes, so very much so, yes. If the singular locus is uh, small, 
you can do better bounds. So here I'll, I'll put the question mark. So something like this. Like this. There is a lot, there is a lot on this topic. But this is difficult. This is due to the name. Our proofs, our proof uh, doesn't uh, care if it's singular or not. Oh, okay. If there are no other questions, let's uh, take Kaluyan again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are these bounds tight? I don't know. I don't know. We don't know if the bounds are tight for the hypersurface. For curves, yes, the Hasseveo bound is tight. But for hypersurfaces, um, we don't know. OK, we continue on Monday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.